Hey, 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 welcome back. I'm Matt, the Healthful Home Inspector, up in our studio in Hartford, Wisconsin, coming at you with some tips and tricks to help you maintain and take care of your house. Today, we have a special guest, Mr. Rust Benzer from the Mobile Repair Guys. How's it going, Russ? Great. How's everybody tonight? Good, man. Good. We're doing good. Back with it here. Um, and uh, Russ is going to come to us today. Our main topic today is going to be talking about small engine repair and maintenance. He just got off the job site, so yeah. he's still he's still, he's still, uh, he's still fresh <laughs> over there. But, uh, you know, he, he, th- he knows how important it is to get help you guys better maintain take care of your homes and he's uh, got some stuff to talk to you and uh, can help you out a little bit here today um now to uh, get the whole show started here we have our defect of the week that we always do and today we're talking hail damage so uh, one of the things that as a home inspector we come across every once in a while is hail damage i mean it's just a fact of life right yep. um hopefully you can cash in on some insurance policies and you know get a new roof out of it but it, it's not always it doesn't always work that way but uh with hail damage um it can come through it can be very damaging not only to your roof but it can be damaging damage into your gutters, your siding, uh, your windows, all that kind of stuff. Um, not to mention any vehicles and things like that to get left outside. Um, but hail generally, when we're talking about hail damage, it's going to be quarter size or larger where you're going to start to experience damage to your roof and personal belongings and things like that. Otherwise, most parts of your house and stuff can take you know, little pebbles and things like that that you would normally get. Um, but when you get those large um, hail um chunks pieces of ice come flying down from the heavens uh hitting your roof okay it can cause a lot of damage to the mat that makes you shingle it'll blast away the granular that's on your roof leaving all kinds of little damage marks it'll also on top of that dent out any uh you know fence and things like that that you might have on your roof um now tammy you can switch over to our computer here you can see um so we had a hailstorm come through um in hartford here on april 19th and there was lots of houses that had some hail damage so i went up there and being a home inspector i'm like i'll go up there and check my own roof so i went up there looked at my roof and i'm like oh i got hail damage so i got to get somebody to come out and look at this stuff okay and so what i did is i called up three roofers to come out and, and assess my roof for hail damage and give me a quote you know to replace the roof because i'm not i mean i could could I re-roof my house? Yeah, sure. I could. Do I have time or the inclination to do so? Or the other no. seven <laughs> Mexicans that come in and do it for me? No, I don't. Okay, nothing against Mexicans. They're not all Mexicans. That roofers, not all roofers are Mexicans. I don't mean to generalize. It's just that when you get hail damage and the, the you know the chasers come around it's what you end up with a lot of uh, a lot right. of indigenous right. workers come and uh you know, do your house um but tammy will go back to the computer here and we'll show you what some pictures of some hail damage to look like so you can see where the hail went in in the middle part here right there okay and then it blasted away the uh the granular in this area now our this this quote was from one of our roofers ridgetop exteriors um matt and nick what i think was his name honey right uh they came out here and they were great um they did a really good job when they go up onto the roof they're gonna take a basically sidewalk chalk and they're gonna mark out all the different hails hail spots and stuff and they label your roof you can see this is what the metal vent for my water heater you can see how it looks like somebody went and hit it with a whole bunch of golf balls and stuff okay um they use chalk that they put across it to kind of help identify identify the indentations and things oh, wow. on the metal but you can see they mark off a 10 foot by 10 foot square he circles some of the worst damaged spots on the roof okay and that's what it would look like up on your roof um and then there's a valley you can see how he's got a dent right there in the valley from a, a chunk of ice coming through this is a really bad one you can see where the chunk just came down and just destroyed the shingle in that area um and it can hit siding and stuff cause all kinds of little siding dents and dings and stuff um there's another one right there, and these things are all over the place up on my roof. These are all pictures from my roof, okay? Now, with three roofers coming in, and they all said, you have significant hail damage. You need to replace this roof. You know, right. there's a lot of damage up there. Um, so then I'm like, okay, I'll call my insurance company, which I've been with for 14 years, okay? Um, the silver lining. Okay? Right. I'm not going to say their <laughs> exact name. Um, been with them for 14 years. So you think after 14 years, and not filing a claim it, it, for anything, not cars well we had a car one car claim um and tammy had a little accident but um other than that no other claims of any kind especially against our homeowner's insurance right you know um and uh they sent out this guy not gonna mention his name he shows up and he walks up like he's got attitude like i'm like what's going on buddy and he's like oh this is you know they're, they're, i've been doing a lot of them around here and there's re- really no hail damage here so you know i'll, I'll go up and take a look though you really know? yeah and that was his attitude when he walked up at the house and i'm like really and he just kind of struts up and he's got his fancy sunglasses on and i'm like okay nice. all right and and the guys from rich shop builders or rich shop uh exteriors came and they were gonna kind of go up there and talk to the guy and show him what they found and stuff sure. you know and uh so they go up on the roof or whatever and this guy doesn't take his sunglasses off the whole time 
and doesn't doesn't look at stuff. And the the roofer is trying to point out things. He's he's basically downplaying or poo pooing it. You know, it doesn't like it doesn't exist or whatever. You know, and he comes off the roof and he's like, I didn't see any uh, major damage up there at all. You know, there's not really anything dented or anything. And I'm, I'm wow. like, really, dude? I'm like, I I went up there and looked at it and it was pretty damaged. I had three roofers come up and they all looked at it and said it was pretty damaged. And then you come and you didn't see anything going on, you know? And he said, no, I'm just going to uh, write this up as a uh, uh, no claim. No claim. And uh, yeah, and go from there. I'm like, <laughs> what the frick? You know, and, and part of the thing is these adjusters, a lot of them are incentivized by their insurance agencies to not find claims. Not find claims. You know, and and and, uh, and granted, I don't, I don't want to if 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 there is no claim, I don't want a frivolous claim. I don't want to I don't want to fault fraud anybody or anything no. like that. But if there's a, a natural natural nature caused damage to my home, legitimate claim, yeah, legitimate claim, then the insurance company that I've been paying for the last fourteen years, I don't even know how much money I paid them over. Right. 14, I mean, because they have our car insurance, they have our homeowner insurance, they have all of our ATVs, our boat, they have everything. Holy cow. I mean, that's <laughs> that's a lot of money every yeah. year that I'm mailing these guys, you know? And to have this guy come out and won't even take off sunglasses. I'm like, well, really? So we use an insurance broker through Colonial Insurance, and that's who we've gone with. And they're like a broker, but our insurance company is actually the silver lining. Mm -hmm. And so then they call it the, the broker calls up silver lining. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, he takes off. He doesn't take off. He wears his sunglasses so he can see the roof better because of the glare. I'm glare like, off of the, the shingles. Glare off of the black <laughs> shingles. Yeah, man. I, I, you realize I'm a, I'm a home inspector. I'm on the roofs and looking at roofs every single day. And you're going to try to hand me a line of BS like that. I'm like, what wow. the? You got to be kidding me, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, so we're still in the battle with that. And just because you have hail damage, just because the roofer finds hail damage, does not necessarily mean it's a slam dunk with your insurance company. Um, some insurance companies, according to the roofers, have are better about it, you know? Yeah. And the, a couple of those, uh, USAA was one that they all said was very good, which is, I mean, it's representing the vets and stuff like that. So that makes sense. Sure. Um, State Farm, they said, was very good. Um, and uh, there was one other one that I can't remember. But, yeah, I, I, and I, I'm just like, well, they sh the adjuster shouldn't necessarily be incentivized for, to not find claims find first claims, of all yeah. you know um and if there's hail damage that you can document and see there shouldn't be an argument well you know? especially with three different roofers coming in and saying you all had damage yeah yeah that's and these aren't buddies of mine these they're all big big companies, companies. Yeah. yeah yeah and these big companies aren't going to put their reputation at risk no. and stuff you know and, and granted if it was some little small Joe Schmo roofing or whatever, you know, that's, you know, got a magnet Fly on the side night. of their, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, 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 then I get it. You yeah. know, they're just out there sometimes just trying to make money or, or a storm chaser company coming up from Florida or something like that. Sure. I get it. But these guys aren't, they're all local, large companies in the area and, yeah, it's just crazy. So um, hail damage can be very damaging to your uh, home. It can cause leaking. It can cause uh, pre pre uh, mature failure of the roof surface. Okay, um, we had when on the April nineteenth storm, we had two inches of hail. We had they had to bring the snow plows around because of the hail yeah. that was gathering everywhere. Um, and uh, basically, with the um, amount of hail that was coming down, all the granular was getting blasted off the shingles. So the guy goes up there. He's like, "Oh, there's a lot of granular loss here. The roof must be really old." I'm like, "It's a." what 19 year old roof you know and you're telling me that after on a 19 year old roof that's supposed to last 40 years there should be this much granular loss and it's not because of age it's because of the hail it's because of all the hail that all the hail hit tore it, it off yeah, exactly mm -hmm. and so all the granular sitting in the gutter and this guy's just a yeah he's just a ding dong but we're working through that and hopefully it'll all resolve did you ask for another inspector or another that agent was, to come out that was what the phone call the west bend mutual was from the so we sent our broker after him you know oh, and sure. the, i figured the broker would have more leverage and stuff like that you yep. know um but yeah they came, they came back with uh that that kind of a response and i'm like huh that's kind of mm, crazy think I would request one yeah i that's what i that Second and that's opinion ultimate, they sent me from, a, yeah they sent me a like a, a sheet to have the roofer fill out i don't know what that's all about but are they going to believe the roofer then well, they didn't when the agent was here. So no, <laughs> yeah, I, I, you had a roofer up there with him. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. So uh, why would you believe the roofer when he fills out a sheet of paper versus when he was actually here to talk with to the, the adjuster? Agent, yeah, yeah. So I don't know, goofy stuff. But hail damage, uh, watch out for it. If you do have it, don't delay your claim. Insurance companies usually will only honor claims up to one year after um, the hailstorm or the 
event of nature, they call it in their terms. But um, definitely something to watch out for. Uh, the next thing we have is something to save a dollar. We always like to give you guys something to save a buck every week. All right. So the thing we're going to give you to save a buck this week is stop using mulch. Okay. Um, <laughs> people, you don't know how to use mulch. Okay. Mulch is not intended to be piled on deteriorate, pile more on, deteriorate, pile on more. Because then you end up with these big piles of mulch up against your siding, causing moisture and insects. and Damage that it, way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the mulch, it costs you a whole bunch of money. I don't know. How much did we spend on mulch when you used to mulch our yard, honey? It was probably like 800 oh, bucks. It was a couple hundred dollars each year. Yeah, it was like. But we some, switched to stone. Yeah, it was somewhere from five to 800 bucks a, a year to mulch our yard. And instead we went stone to like. It was a, a one payment deal. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm sick of spending 500 bucks every year. Instead, I spent 500 bucks. The stone company over on off of 41 there, they came in and delivered uh, 10 yards of uh, crushed red granite rock for me or whatever. Yep. Took a little time to put it out. No more than I would spend doing the mulch, you know. Right. And I never have to mulch again, you know. <laughs> I never have to mulch again. It doesn't deteriorate. It doesn't go away. It doesn't blow away when I'm blowing it out because of the grass clippings and stuff. Um, yeah. And 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 I, on the ten yards, I had five extra buckets of it, so I can always refill it if I need to, you know, and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we did it once, and we've been enjoying the 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 uh, fruits of that that labor for the last five years. Haven't had to pay that five hundred bucks. You don't have any wash away either no. from rain heavy yep. rain or whatever yep. yep the stones will be there stones will be there and the mulch also you can get those mosses and things that grow out of it and the mushroom none of that yeah you could still power wash the stones off you could power wash yeah if it does get <laughs> dirty or something like that yeah, yeah for sure for sure so that is save a buck switch out to some decorative stone stop using mulch people mulch it deteriorates it's a i don't know how much money people make on mulch <laughs> sales every tons. year tons um yes. but it's because you're just you're misusing it you're, you're you know just causing yourself some issues so get some decorative stone it'll last longer perform better for you and in the long run even if you have to pay a little bit more to do it it'll save you a ton of money every single year okay so i'm not just saving you a buck i'm saving you hundreds of bucks okay <laughs> so go out and save yourself some money people all right um all right so now we're going to get into our main topic of the day we're talking about um small engine repair and maintenance uh, with our man russ benzer from the mobile repair guys if you want to get a hold of the mobile repair guys we will flash their number up down below here we'll also have their number on our website you can go get a hold of them there their website uh is linked on there as well you can also email them call them i mean yeah lots of yeah, ways you can get lots a hold of, of ways to get a hold of us yep uh yes. now generally you guys work southeastern wisconsin yep all primarily. southeastern wisconsin right now yep. um we're looking to expand, you know, we are so busy with uh, the service work right now and maintenance. Yeah. Um, we're looking to expand and have uh, either employees or the opportunity to purchase and own your own business as a franchisee. Yeah. You guys um, have been franchising uh, for a while now. We uh, started franchising in 2012. Yeah. Um, I've got... Two really good guys right now. One guy in Germantown and Omni Falls. What's his name? Give him a shout out. Lee, uh, <laughs> Lonnie Merchant is his name. Okay. And then I've got Chris Henson, who is taking care of um, like Sussex, Merton, Okachi, a little bit of Pewaukee area there. Yeah. So, so. and basically you're just looking for somebody that's mechanically inclined. Yep. Right. And that has a driver's license. <laughs> you got <laughs> to license, you gotta be yeah. able to drive. They are the mobile repair guys. Yes. So the, the basic concept with the mobile repair, you guys, you guys, is, uh, you know, that shop that used to haul your snowblower into in the back of your car with a bungee cord holding the tailgate down. We come to you at no extra charge. Yeah, they come to you. They bring the whole shop to you. At no extra charge. And mm -hmm. and you're like, how can they do that? Well, okay, they don't have to pay for a shop. They don't have to pay for a lease. They don't have to pay for all that yeah. other stuff. Our overhead is is very minimal. Um, and we do. We actually come right to your house and do the repairs and uh, minor tune-ups or minor repairs at your house. Yeah. So. And they, I, I have been a customer of them. Uh, probably. Did you look me up at all? Uh, I think What's it was... It? Since eight years ago, eight years ago, I yeah, I think so. Was the first time I called. Yeah, I saw you. You were uh, filling up over at the BP here, and yeah. I saw you, and I talked with you. Then I'm like, I got my snowblower just won't go. What's <laughs> going on? And she's like, call, call Janet up and set up an appointment or whatever, yep. you know. And uh, they came out there, and I've had so I've had the same snow. We got that blower in 2009, I think, wasn't it, honey? That Craftsman. We got it at Sears yeah. before Sears closed. Okay, yeah. Yeah. and uh, it's been a great lawnmower, but. I don't get to use it all that often. And so right. the, with the, the ethanol fuel and everything, the, the carburetor would get clogged up and 
I don't know how to take apart the carburetor yeah. and clean it. If I if I spent enough time searching around YouTube, maybe I could figure it out because I'm pretty mechanically inclined myself. But I don't have the time to do that. And why not let gasoline heck- and carburetors is the most common problem yeah. that we have. So. Yeah. yeah, and that's on snowblowers and lawnmowers, right? Yes, and all the small engines. All the small engines doesn't stuff. make any difference what it is. Chainsaws, weed eaters, generators. Yeah, the gas sits in there too long and it gums up the carb. And the, the, the gumming up, there's like a little pinhole that the, the is basically the carburetor is needle, regulating needle size hole. Yeah, yep. that's regulating how much fuel gets spurted out in into there. the air with it. Yep. You know, and when that little hole gets clogged up with anything, yeah, chunk work. of dirt just debris um yeah and then the ethanol actually is well it's corn syrup yeah is what they're yeah. putting in there so. well and and when you're talking about that little uh needle va- needle what is it called the needle valve the needle needle no, just a needle needle yeah. yeah when you when that gets uh blot you have to take it apart to get to it it's not something that you can just spray out from outside yeah. the thing inside the carb you yeah take the carburetor apart bowl off the bottom and then clean it all out yeah so yeah and what do you use to clean that just regular carb cleaner. Carb cleaner? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that gets that cleans up the gunk and junk. And, yeah, takes yeah. it all off and, and cleans the, it up. And that, it like, just works its way into that needle hole or to clean it out? Or how does that get it? Or do you guys have, like, a tool? No, have I've to got s- a small tool that we use to, depending on which carburetor it actually is, yeah. to run up inside there. And then the emulsion tube gets plugged, too. So yeah. Yeah. we take that apart and clean all the fuel just sits in little there. jets and stuff that are little holes that are in there. Sure, sure, clean sure. Clean it all out. Um, now, uh, when it comes to, uh, the mobile repair guys, you guys, what you, uh, basically do is you call and set up an appointment and do you guys do estimates or you don't do estimates over the phone. Do we'll you? give you a, unless it's like a, a tune up regular tune up estimate. Yeah, yeah. We can determine that. And our hourly rate is, you know, uh, a hundred dollars an hour. And then we charge by the half hour at 50. Okay. For general labor. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then our tune ups are all standard prices and they're on the website. If you didn't want to look that oh, up. Oh, Okay. Cool. Yeah. And basically what they do is when they show up, they'll diagnose the problem, right? Yep. And then you'll come up with a plan to correct the problem. And if it's uh, expensive, you'll run it by the homeowner probably, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. We give them a, an upfront estimate um, of estimated cost mm-hmm. that it would cost for the repair and parts yeah. and labor. Yeah. And, yeah. And the beautiful thing about when you guys came to work for me is I couldn't be home. So right. I just set it outside, and you guys showed up, and I showed up. I showed up at home. You you, you even snowblowed part of my driveway for me <laughs> at the time, and uh, yeah. and the thing was humming like a like a charm, you know. And yeah, we we do that quite often where the homeowners are at work or whatever, and uh, they just leave the units outside. Yep. We come and repair them, leave the invoice in the door, and yeah, you guys shoot me a check or a call with a credit card over the phone. Yep. Yeah, it worked great. It was uh, a really smooth operation. It was easy to use you guys, and uh, uh, it's so much better than trying to hook up a trailer. Find a trailer, because I don't yeah. keep a trailer at home here. It's, it's all about convenience all for you, yeah. you know, and that's that's why we created this in the first place. And Yeah. You get to put on a lot of miles. How many miles do you put on your truck every year? Oh, gosh. Over 50. Yeah. 50,000. That's more than me. I put on about, yeah. f- what, 40, honey-ish? 40-something? He's like, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it uh, is one of those things when you, when you work for people and you go to where they need you, you put on miles. It's just yeah part of the That's deal, part of the job. Yep, exactly. Um, so uh, as far as um, lawnmower, small engine equipment, they yeah. don't they don't make them like they used to. Do they? <laughs> no, 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 they don't. Uh, they're a lot of them are actually throwaway items per se. Okay, you know, yeah. um, but we can make them run. You know for a long longer period of time before you do have to replace them. Yeah. And there you're and talking about job. like hedge trimmers, yeah. string trimmers, that kind yep. of stuff. Yeah. And there again, if you do have problems with those, you know, we're kind of upfront with you. Um, come to your house and if it's not worth fixing, we'll be upfront with you and just tell you to go buy a new one. Yeah. Well, what's the By point the time of spending four hundred dollars to, to fix to it? To do it, yeah, yeah. To do it. And then, you know, if you're paying a couple hundred bucks to uh buy a new one compared to paying me yeah. You know, that similar amount of money to get a carburetor and fix it and yeah. my yeah. time. So If you want to fix, he'll fix it. But yeah. he'll he'll give you the I, honest truth, though, about uh, yeah. if it's even worth fixing. And that's like with a lot of things these days. You know right. what I mean? Uh, when it comes to uh, um, a dryer, you know, a dryer in your home. I mean, the guy's going to show up at your house, want to charge you 450 bucks to, to repair a, a belt that's inside your dryer because you take the whole thing apart, you know. Yeah. And by that time, you could spend 350 bucks and go out and get a brand new brand dryer. New it just sometimes it just doesn't make sense. And and 
yeah, I know if you're a tree hugger and you want to save the earth, whatever, that, then fix it, pay the extra money, who cares? But um, for your average person, it just may not make sense. Right. You know, and you just got to weigh that. So for sure. Now, as far as uh, small engines, um, small engines really haven't changed all that much. The concept of the small engine. No. Right? no um, it's basically spark, gas, and... And air. And air. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and with uh, small engines, the only thing that I've seen over the last maybe 10 years is that you've seen some small engines go to four cycle instead of what was always two cycle. Right. Before. Yeah, a lot of the, even the weed trimmers and stuff are four cycle now. Yeah, yeah. Which so. is uh, basically it just means you uh, have separate oil and gas. Yep. Um, as far as the operation, it doesn't change much. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you don't the two cycle the the gas was in the oil, the oil was in the gas, which would lubricate your engine. Now you have to have that separated out gas for the most part. Oil, yep. Yeah, um, but uh, life expectancy doesn't change with two cycle versus four cycle, does it? No, yeah. no, not at all. Yeah, um, your maintenance is a little different as far as how to take uh, care of it. how to take care of it. Yeah, yeah. but other than that, it it doesn't change a whole lot at all. Yeah. Yeah. And the main operation is not going to change at all. Cause you're still doing the same operation. It's just the engine, the motor is what we're talking about. It's a there. little different. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Now, a lot of times when people are going to, to buy small engines, uh, the engine will be listed in CCs. Yeah. What, what are they talking about? Russ? <laughs> we don't know. We don't know that stuff. It's your cubic capacity. As far as what a motor is, as far as your CCs go. Um, and the, the difference is the measurement of the volume of size of the engine. And then your horsepower is the measurement of uh, what, how much power that engine's actually going to have. Now, how do CCs and horsepower relate to each other? They're very similar. Uh, like I said, it's just the measurement of that. Okay. Um, your horsepower, like you have a 17 horsepower motor, it's kind of equal to, uh, I believe it's, 220 cc's okay so um sure. you're it, it's it's just a different way of labeling that motor and the amount it's of power a, that it can generate correct okay yeah so if you're going to talk about um like a, a motorcycle sometimes are talked about in cc's as stuff as well right yeah so you could also talk about that in a horsepower number as well just like um uh what, what is something in in my world that they talk about is uh energy you know so we can talk about in an air conditioner we can talk about btus and we can talk about sears and it's the same thing we're just talking about the measuring in a different yeah. way you know Correct. so um so that's what ccs are you guys the more ccs you have the more horsepower you have the more horsepower you have the more ccs you have um Correct. and the the stronger the engine is um generally the um more work can be done. Yeah, right? it's usually the a larger unit, the higher horsepower that you have or CCs that you have. Yeah, so if your lawnmower is a uh, uh, you know seventeen horse motor on it versus a twelve horse motor on it, you're going to be able to go faster. Your blades can spin faster. Um, at life expectancy, doesn't change. Oh, it might have to might be a little uh, bit easier. To, it will to run, be. Right? Yeah, it'll run a little longer probably. Yeah. Um, just because it's not working as hard as the smaller motor. Yeah, yeah. Because so, the smaller motor, you may have to rev it at higher RPMs to get the same amount of work done as correct a lower RPMs, but a higher. And your wear and tear motor. on the inside of the motor is going to be more. Sure, 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 sure. Okay, cool. Um, now, uh, what makes one small engine better than another? In your eyes, <laughs> mostly it's just preference. I mean, they're made um, by different companies, but the components inside are pretty much all the same. Yeah. Um, there's not a really a whole lot of difference between the motors. Okay. Um, so if you're going to fleet farm and you're looking at three different types, types of string trimmers with three different motors on them, yeah. go with the better brand or whether that, what that has a better reputation, maybe just if the engine doesn't matter that much. Yeah. I mean, I, I there again, it, it's, it's more of a personal preference kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, if you were going to fleet farm, what brand would you buy Russ? Um, I probably wouldn't buy it from a box store. Where would you buy it? <laughs> At a dealer. At a dealer. Yeah. Okay. I would go to, uh, like a true value or okay. like to, uh, I, I used to work at TV trailers. Okay. And they sell not a box store brand. Model. It's a little bit yeah. better quality. Sure. Than sure. you would get at a box store. So like, uh, 
Where would be a co- I mean a common place? I mean Ace True uh, like True Ace Value. True Value. Yeah. I mean they they do carry a little bit better. Um, like they carry units. steel and all that kind steel, of steel. Yeah, Echo. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, steel and Echo are probably the two better ones out there that most people yeah. have access to. And now some of the box stores are even carrying those too. So. Yeah, Troy Belt's a good one too, but you just don't see those as often, right? I mean, I mean they're right along the lines of Toro and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, they're comparable. Yeah. They're a little bit lower lower end as far as yeah that what you're going to get at a box store. Mm-hmm. They have a few Husk- different Husqvarna. Where does that fall in there? Um, that's like mid grade. Is that mid grade? Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. They still sell. Um, those at a box store also. Oh, they but do. The, okay. Yeah, there's a few box stores out there that do have Husqvarna's. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, and if it's a name you've never heard of before, be a little wary. I would say. Yeah, right. double check. Do your homework. Yeah, I mean that's the best way. Yep. Yep. Look I them mean, up, the, the find internet out what is a doing. beautiful thing. Yeah, you it know? Is. and people Very will not hold back if it's <laughs> bad stuff. You know, right? Um, you can if if you uh, go out there and look up ratings and reviews and things like that. There's there's like websites out there that all they do is review lawn equipment and stuff. Yes. Like that. So yep. you can go out there and find some information about that and uh, get some uh, internet experts. <laughs> uh, to give you some information. But the best way to go about that is if you look over and you get that same information from a number of different sources, it's got more Usually legitimacy pretty good. to it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you're just getting from one blowhard that had one problem, it's kind of hard to, you know, break that out as a legitimate source. Correct. You know? Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is a little bit about uh, fuel for small engines. So when it comes to fuel for small engines, um, the, the biggest change that's happened over the last 15, 20 years is the in, in the installation of ethanol yes. in our gasoline pretty much everywhere. I mean, is there anywhere that we can go and get ethanol free gasoline anymore? Oh, sure. There's you can actually places. buy it, you know, in a can. It's called True Fuel. Like this guy? Yes. So That's this, one of your brands as far as. Yep. So this is ethanol free. Yep. It says no ethanol right on it. Um, it's not cheap. No. Nope. But it's, it's a little bit more expensive. Ethanol free and going to cause less gumming up in your carburetors and things Correct. like that. Right. Yep. Um, and it actually comes in a mix too. Um, this is just a four cycle. And then you also have a 50 to one. And that's for your two cycle engines. Yeah. Now, if a, if an engine says it's supposed to run on 40 to one and you put in 50 to one, is it going to make a difference? Yeah, you could burn it up. You could really. Because mm-hmm. so 50 to one is thinner on the oil side. Correct. So if it, you went, if it said use 50 to one and you put in 40 to one, you're yeah. probably going to be okay. You'll be okay. Yeah. Okay. You should be fine. So if you're going to buy the, uh, the 40 to one is like a bluish green can, I think. Correct. Or whatever. So yep. if you don't know which, but yours have a two cycle equipment, buy the 40 to one mix and you're probably going to be okay. You'll be okay. It'll smoke a little bit more just because yeah. you have more oil in it. Yep. But yep. But it'll still run. It'll, it'll still be, be lubricated. Fun. Yeah. Where you, if you go the other way, this doesn't have as much oil in it. It may not be lubricating it well enough. enough. You can burn up your chainsaw, or whatever you're putting it in. Correct. Stuff. So, yeah. Um, now, as far as uh, the canned fuels, um, they last longer than gas station fuel. They correct. Yep. Um, what's the average life expectancy of gas uh, station fuel? Six months, maybe? No. Not even? No, I would. <laughs> it actually starts to break down after five to six weeks. So yeah, Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you do have that gas and you don't have oil in it, you could put it in your vehicle. Yeah. And then it'll mix in with your gas in the tank. And your car be fine. can handle that. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your car engine will handle it fine. Yep. Otherwise, your small engine's really like fresh gas. Fresher, the better. Ninety-two yep. percent octane is great. What now? Uh, what when you get into there's, there's uh, what's the oil company over there in Slinger? They sell race fuel. Like you can go in there and buy a can like this of race fuel. Is that even better? Because it's like ninety, whatever ninety-six octane or whatever it is. Or yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, the 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 more oct or. The higher the octane, the better for the small engine. The cleaner the fuel is then. Correct. Too. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, and then these cans, you guys, you can buy them just about anywhere. I mean, they have them at the Ace. They have them at the Menards and the Home Depots. Box and everything. De- yeah, all the box stores have yep. it. Um, they do have a date on them, though, which is that how important is the date on these guys when you go to buy them? Um, it's pretty important. I mean, you should try to use it by that expiration date, I guess, is what it is. But, but it's still going to last a lot It'll longer. still... It'll still be okay after yeah. that expiration date, but you got to use it 
fairly quickly. Yeah, you don't want to let it sit there forever. Correct. And then if you do buy the uh, the oil mix, it does separate uh, eventually, so you got to shake, shake it up it a little bit. You yep, shake it. it up, tip it upside down, rock it around. Um, if it's been sitting there for a while, it can uh, kind of separate a little bit. So you want to yeah. mix that all up. The main thing to understand with uh, uh, when it says fifty to one or forty one is that that is the mixture of uh, fuel to oil. Um, and that'll be labeled right on the top of the fuel cap whenever whatever. Yeah. Whatever small, small unit sure. you have. Yeah, so like if you have a backpack blower, it'll be on the little orange cap that you take off and stuff right. like that. Sure, yeah. Um, now, as far as um, the uh, the ethanol that's in fuel, um, it, you said it's basically like corn syrup. Pretty much. There, yep. you know? That's what they're um, doing. <laughs> and uh, they're trying to keep constantly trying to push to put more and more ethanol into our fuel yeah um and the corn farmers love that because then they get subsidies and everything right. else right yeah. um but it's really not good for our small engines it's not good i mean you hear about the snowmobile guys who were probably the loudest i mean when they did the ethanol thing you know the yeah. snowmobile guys were the loudest yeah. about the whole thing about how it destroying their machines and stuff um and i guess some people are like is that really true or is it an old wives tale and i think no, it has an element true. of truth to it yeah. you know um can ethanol run through an engine yes but then you need to take extra maintenance steps in cleaning that engine and all that kind of stuff that you wouldn't have had to do had you not had ethanol in it. right yep so when it comes to uh e85 i i mean other than your car i don't think that's anything you should mess no yeah try not to use that at all yeah when you go to uh the e85 most of the gas stations like quick trip and stuff have the e85 and stuff yep but that's only for such a few vehicles out there you know um that actually yeah just a handful yeah um but for your small engines please yeah avoid it it's a a dollar cheaper okay and and I, I live with a cheapskate, okay? <laughs> so I know how that goes. But saving a dollar on that fuel could cost you hundreds of dollars in repairs. Go ahead. Nothing. I was just going to say, hey, hey, hey. Stop <laughs> the dicks. <laughs> All right, honey. I can go buy some hamburger buns. Um, <laughs> but with the... <laughs> Sorry, she's giving me an eye over there. <laughs> I won't tell the story, I promise. Okay, so what's E85 fuel used for? E85 fuel is only for a couple of uh, uh, cars or vehicles out there. It Just should never, no. yeah, never use it in a small engine, never put it in your string trimmer, never put it in your uh, lawnmower, none of that. Um, it's just got extra ethanol in it. So it's got extra corn syrup, okay, <laughs> in it, which will gum up your engine and cause problems. And there is ways to clean it, but it's kind of a pain in the butt, you know? And It gets how, into everything. Yeah. I mean, that it's... And I can't, Terrible. I can't see, even if you use those, uh, the ethanol cleaners and stuff, it, I can't see it getting it completely clean in there. I mean. No, you're, uh, you're probably never going to get it all out of there. Yeah. Once it's in it. Once you burn it, it's yeah. got the, sh- there's some sugars in there too that can adhere yep. to the walls of the, the piston rings and all that kind of jazz. So yeah, something I'd avoid. Kind of eats away at the O-rings inside the. Oh, really? Carburetor. Dries them out or. A little bit of both. them. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay, so um, if you can, you can go to some. There are some gas stations where they will sell ethanol-free gas, but you got to usually go out in the sticks to find. Yeah, you got to find right? in the outskirts. Yeah, and sometimes it's also more expensive because and always will be a little bit more expensive. Yeah. 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 So, is um, the best fuel to use the cans? Yeah, but I mean that's really expensive compared to your regular fuels. Um, just try to get your premium gas. You know. Get, yeah, from the gas stations if you're gonna buy it from octane. yeah yeah and like maybe at the end of the season when you're going to winterize your 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 lawnmower that would be great to use, this, use uh, some of true this. fuel because yeah. it's gonna sit right yep. yeah yeah it's gonna sit you um, always want to run it dry at the end of the season th- okay that was a discussion we were gonna have yeah oh, okay and yeah running it dry at the end of the season really gets all that cleans out all that fuel out of there but you still have yeah. some sitting in there right a little bit yes yeah. so that's why you want to add a little bit of Fuel stabilizer to your gas uh, before see, you store it. That's called a lead-in, people. Russ, <laughs> he, 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 he committed a lead-in all on his own without even having to be taught. Uh, so, well, yeah, so one of the next things we're talking about is fuel stabilizer. So I got – I just – I just swung into Menards and grabbed a couple of things that I could grab real quick sure. so we had something on the table to talk about. Um, these are all different fuel stabilizers that you could readily pick up at your uh, big box store, that kind of stuff. Any of them. Yeah, they'll – all the stores handle this stuff. Your um, lawnmower, which one's going in? I use Seafoam myself. Seafoam. Yep. So Seafoam is something that we use on all of our ATVs at North and stuff. Um, it holds up really, it's really uh, good for uh, low temperatures and stuff like that as well. Yeah, I use it in my boat 
especially yeah. for the winter. Yeah, and you're not going to so. get that burnout when you first start up the machine or anything like no. that. You don't get any of that. Like if you put stable in, you're going to get some dark smoke and yep. some you know some puttering and stuff like that, which. It's got to work its way through there. Yeah. It doesn't mix as well as the sea foam or mm-hmm. uh, the, that one there. True. This one? Yep. This is, uh, this is a um, Startran. Startran enzyme. Yeah. Uh, this is newer to the market. I mean, but. That's a good product too. Yeah. All uh, the guys. I have used that in a few things and it, it's a, it's a good product also. Sure. All the guys at the ATV shop and stuff, they, this is what they're saying for your ATVs and motorcycles and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And it, it's supposedly just a capful of it. I'm yep. like, wow. That's <laughs> Same thing with your seafoam. A couple capfuls per gallon is yeah. kind of the recommended amount Dosage. that you want to put in. Dosage. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, and then uh, as far as uh, this one is more of a uh, um, claims to clean better, but. Yeah, ethanol, it's, ethanol shield. I don't know if it really does anything more than any of the others. It's but. more of a oil kind of base, and it kind of coats everything. Oh, okay. A little more, sure. Um, and then your ethanol stuff isn't supposed to stick to like oh, your inner stick parts to that and surface. stuff. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. So, um, so fuel stabilizers a great thing to um, question the hardest small engine you've ever had to repair was the question on the thing. There. What was oh. this, this, the hardest small engine to repair? Probably the tinier, the harder, right? No, I mean, I got into uh, a few of the boat motors oh, okay. where they actually, the older ones, I don't work on any of the computerized ones they have, but the, yeah. the smaller, older boat motors and stuff, that was probably the, the hardest one I ever had to work on was a three-cylinder outboard. Yeah, well, and they um, cram it into such a tiny compartment, yeah. you know. Yep, and the boat. carburetors are all, you know, really tight and... Mm-hmm. Um, that was one of the hardest ones I had to ever fix. So. Yeah. Well, and the, the thing with what Russ does, you guys, is understand that all the small engines have basically the same parts. They look different. They're different sizes, but yep. they're basically the same parts. So as long as you can learn how to work on one, you can learn how to work on other ones. And if you are at all mechanically inclined, you have any interest in, in a starting a business for yourself or being your own boss and determine what days you work or don't work, okay, and you want to make some good money doing it, uh, get a hold of the mobile repair guys. They are looking current Currently for franchisees and where you would be running your own show, okay, um, and uh, basically operate under their their flagship, okay. Yeah, the other way, if you aren't, if you're not, you don't want to operate a business, you don't want to get into being a business owner, okay. They also are, we're, would be looking at taking on employees right now. They're crazy busy. Yeah. A lot of the um, small uh, engine repair shops and things like that are closing these days. Yeah, and, we've had quite a few of the area uh, shops have closed just recently, um, and. Uh, Unfortunately, there's just no place to take this stuff. Yeah. And we're getting calls. Thankfully, you don't have to take it anywhere. Right. The guys will come to you, baby. (laughs) That's the way the mobile repair guys work. Um, But, yeah, if you're at all interested in getting into that field or you're mechanically inclined and want to be your own boss and stuff, Russ will take you under the wing. Yeah, he'll take you under the wing. He'll teach you the ways of the world um, and uh, teach you how to repair small engines. I mean, even if you don't know how to fix small engines, but you're mechanically inclined. Yeah, we're looking for just anybody that wants to learn uh, to come on board and, and... the way that works is you get to ride with me for a day and see if you want to do this for a living. Um, and I, I'll teach you everything you need to know about running a business. If you want to go that route, as far as being a franchisee and, uh, just the opportunity is is there for you. Yeah, and the franchisee thing, you basically turnkey. You guys give them all the equipment, all the stuff, all set up for you, all ready to, ready to go. You got all the the most the of the software guys, and everything. Yeah, most of the territories that I sell, um, you're going to start with a customer base already built into it. Yeah, you know, uh, most of the guys are starting with at least five to six hundred customers day one. Already working, already working, already up and running. Yeah. You know, I've been doing this around here, you know, that long that we have territories available right now. Um, that I could stick you into and you'll be up and running in business, making money your first day. And it might be in your backyard. Who knows? Oh, you know, I want you to be close to your territory. That's kind of the way it's set up. Yeah. Um, So you don't have to drive as much. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like I got a guy in German town and he falls, he travels about 15 minutes from his house. Yeah. That's ideal. That's ideal. A 15 minute commute. Yep. 
There you go. Perfect. Um, now, um, as far as uh, uh, Octane, we have talked about that a little bit uh, briefly, um, that with Octane, you always want to try to buy the higher the Octane you can get, the better it is for your small engines. Um, and uh, the higher the Octane, I think it lasts a little longer, too, because it's just a cleaner, more refined fuel. Yeah. Right? So it lasts yes. a little bit longer as far as lifespan. Um, race fuels are just the higher Octane. When I when I mentioned that, you guys, you can go out and you can buy cans of race fuel if you want. It's just the higher Octane. There is no fuel that you can go and buy that's going to last forever okay it's nothing that that you you preppers out there um and i know who you are i'm kind of a little <laughs> bit of one of them myself but um i i have been on the, the hunt for what fuel is going to last the longest and what fuel can i stabilize to last longest but ultimately um what you're looking at is probably a year lifespan on the cleanest fuel right yeah that's about yeah i mean you don't want it to last or sit any longer than that yeah i mean there again like i said if you do have it sitting in a can Try to rotate that through, you know, pour it in your car and get some fresh stuff for your small engines yep. is the best thing. The car is know. designed to handle that. You yeah, know? it's going to mix in with your gas that you have. And you're never going to notice a difference. No. Yeah. No. Nope. Yeah. By pouring just five gallons in there or whatever you got. So yep. um, as far as um, uh, fuel stabilizers, we talked about that. Seafoam is mine and Russ's suggestion if you're looking to just stabilize your fuel for the winter and stuff like that. Um, but uh, these aren't things that you use all the time. Right, these are only things you use when you're not going to be using the equipment for a period of time, right? Or is it well, good to use I mean, it for you, cleaning? You can add like the seafoam and stuff. You can add that all year long if you'd like to. Is it going to uh, help? Is it going to help the engine? It will keep it cleaner. Oh, okay. You know, it, it's right. got a cleaner additive right in it, yep. and it does stabilize your fuel. Is there any additive for a little long, longer longevity yeah. of your gas? Then it'll last a little longer. Is there any additives that are crucial, like things that we should all be putting in our fuel? To no. Help keep our engine running better? Well, I mean, there are going to be your small engines. If you're running them all the time, yeah. more often, you know, then there's really nothing that you have to add to it. Yeah. You're running your fuel through it, and that should keep it clean. That'll help clean it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, add it, all those additives that you can go to the hardware store and buy, you guys, you can buy a can of seafoam. <laughs> okay, that's the way to go. Um, and then uh, we talked. We did talk about two cycle and four cycle engines, and uh, and a little bit of the fuel oil mixtures and stuff like that already. Um, but one of the topics that uh, I I put on our list to talk about, and I didn't know how 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 it is for you guys, but electric equipment still in a learning curve as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, um, I, I think there's a lot of bugs and stuff they got to work out. They are getting better. You know, they're getting better all the time. Uh, yeah. Batteries are lasting longer. Yeah. Will you service electric equipment? I, no. I, I'm not into that yet. Um, mm -hmm. I did have Milwaukee Tool come and ask me if I wanted to go to one of their classes and stuff. I said I'd send my technicians and stuff. And, yeah, yeah I would be interested in getting into that, you know, because it is the future, I believe. It, 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 to a certain extent. Yeah. I don't, I don't think uh, you're never going to get away from small engines. No, period. I think the gas is always going to be there for us, you yeah. know. It just provides. But the electric is, it is coming and it's getting better. The gas provides so much more flexibility, you know. I, mean, I agree. There's some things that I like with electric, like our string trimmer. I, yep. I love the electric string trimmer because I never run out of a battery, so I don't have to worry about that. Right. Just the power, too. And. My, my guys, I love my guys. Okay, they gave me an electric chainsaw. I don't like it. <laughs> um, the problem with the electric chainsaw is it goes burns through a battery so fast. When I have a fuel, uh, uh, my when I have my Echo out there or, or my still, I can just fill it up or whatever and keep going. But right. when the batteries, I mean, how many times do we have to run back to the barn when we're doing logs, Tammy, just to swap these batteries? Yeah, I got my exercise that oh uh, my afternoon. Gosh. <laughs> I mean, and it cuts nice, but it, the battery issue is just... Yeah. And, and the only way you, you fix that is by getting a bigger, heavier battery, which the thing already is heavier than a uh, gas-powered chainsaw anyways. Right. And the so, batteries aren't cheap, you no. know, to replace them and even no. to buy extra to have them already charged for, your, you know, like your chainsaw. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you got to have four or five of them to yep. run a whole day. Well, and the batteries go bad eventually. Right? Eventually they yeah. will. And they so do lose, lose their longevity too, their you know, after to, a while. Yeah, it's like their storage ability it gets yeah. lower and lower as it goes on. But like some of the new equipment they're coming out with, like a zero, like Ego, I think they have a zero turn uh, mower that's battery operated now. Yeah. But the battery's like sealed in the thing, you know, and I don't know. That just sounds like a, a no. lot of money for something that ain't going to last forever, you know? Yeah. I, it, it's just costly to, uh, 
buy new batteries and stuff, those cells and stuff that they're saying that they, mm-hmm. they're going to be able to, you know, just recharge them and replace them. Yeah. They, they're still, it's, it's a big learning curve yet. Yeah. I believe. And you guys, so. as far as the service side of things, there's not a lot of service out there for those things either. You guys, Russ is not, no. that he's not behind the times on things. Okay. <laughs> it's just that the electric equipment, there's so many different variations of it and everyone is making their own thing that it's not right. like small engines where they're all the same, just different size parts. You know what I mean? Um, so there's just, uh, you don't have the support. You don't have the service uh, uh, ability of it. Yeah. You could maybe send something to ego, but well, there's not a lot know. of techs out there. There's not yeah. a lot of places you could take it and, and get it fixed. Yeah, incredibly expensive. And if you're, even if all you do is look at the battery, the battery on, on a large battery system like that, maybe five years, six years. If that, <laughs> he's like, oh, I don't know about that. I can't even give you a date. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, it's, time frame. It's tough. But it's, you know what? My John Deere that I got out there has been running for 16 years and still cuts <laughs> like a champ, you still know? going. Yeah. Or even that uh, that Craftsman snowblower that I got, you know? I mean, yeah. that thing, I'm probably, you get to pass that down to my kids. They're going to pass it on to their kids sure. because I take care of it. And then I also have Russ come out and take care of it for me <laughs> once in a while too. But you know what? Those those uh, gas-powered engines like that, they're gonna, they can last a really, Forever. really, really long time. Especially if you take care of it. If you take care of it. Yeah. Yep. yep. If you take care of it. And, uh, you know, when we get around to uh, um, winter time, you guys, maybe we'll have Russ back and we'll kind of go over, you know, how to, you know, do some simple maintenance, you know, and, sure. and stuff like that. But I'd love to come back. Yeah. Now, um, as far as uh, that uh, um, electrical equipment, if you have any questions and uh, concerns or anything like that, I have done a lot of research about that. And I do have some electrical equipment myself, but it's not uh, like I, I'm looking at electric string trimmer. I do have the electric chainsaw. I'm not a huge fan of that. Um, I have uh, a uh, electric um, tree lopper you know like the milwaukee oh, chainsaw the thing on the end yeah and chainsaw pole and that's fine that's fine too you know yeah. what i mean that works that works fine but you're again you're not using a lot of battery juice to operate that thing you know for because you're only cutting through little branches and stuff right um but when you come to uh, operating a chainsaw cutting through big logs i would cut through maybe get 12 15 12 to 15 cuts out of the thing and then, then Battery's dead. Battery's dead, and I'm stuck. You know, and Tammy, I need a new one. battery. <laughs> the other ones are still charging. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay, bring me a Diet gotta, Coke, whatever. Gotta wait 15 minutes. Yeah, exactly, or more. Some of those yeah. big batteries take a long time to charge, you yeah. know. So uh, the next thing we have is uh, when it comes to summer coming, one of the things that we need to put away for the summer is our snowblower. And yep. what can we do to put away our snowblower properly to make sure that it comes out of summer and is ready for use in winter without a lot of headaches. There again, we'll go back to the uh, fuel stabilizer. Um, try to run it um, completely out of fuel if you can. You, you're not going to get it all out of there. So do we put the fuel your, stabilizer in and then your, run it? Yes. Okay. Add your stabilizer first and then run it as far down as you possibly can. Okay. So and don't, then that'll go through the carburetor and lube that up and stuff. And So the gas that they have in their snowblower has been sitting there for a little while. Right. right. So just run the whole tank out? Well, if you can siphon out most of it and okay. then add your fuel stabilizer to whatever's left in the, the bottom of the tank. Okay. And then run it until it dies or run most of it out. Okay. That's the so, best way to store it for the... So a couple capsules so, in the fuel. Yep. Run it till it dry, till it's dry. It's gonna sit on your front yard and putter, putter, putter at the end. Correct. Um, and then uh, when it when it uh, dies, should you try to start it again to get all of it out? Or no, no. Once it dies, you'll be fine. Okay. And then if there is a fuel shutoff valve on the tank, yeah, I would turn that off and then let it idle until it dies. The last couple of, of runs or whatever. Sure. Yeah. And then that'll burn the gas or most of the gas that's in the carburetor out. Okay. That empties out the bowl. Correct. Okay. Then when you add fuel in the fall to start your snowblower, you're adding fresh fuel, you open up that valve, and then you got fresh gas going to your carburetor. Okay. So after you run it dry, you don't need to put anything in the tank. No, because you already did with because you ran the stabilizer. Yes. Too. Okay. Yep. All right. And then when the summer when the when the uh, 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 summer's over, time to get ready for winter here. You know, um, okay. get some probably start with some canned fuel. Wouldn't be if a bad you, thing. That would be a good thing to yeah. clean it a little bit. Or the and, higher octane is the better. Yeah, and then when you go to start it for the first time, mm-hmm. little 
sea little foam sea in foam, there. sure. Yeah, little sea foam in there to help clean that all out from anything that's been sitting in there and getting grungy over the last three, four, five months, five whatever months. it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and that's the way to go. So, uh, so to so to summarize this, to put away your snowblower for the year, okay. Um, put a little fuel stabilizer in. Well, get rid of a little bit of the gas if you have it topped off, if you can siphon any out. If you can't siphon it out, that's fine. Then just put a little bit more of this in there because this is this is based on one cap per gallon of fuel. Correct. So if you ha- if you are, your snowblower has maybe at the most a gallon and a half in it, right? Two-gallon tank on there? Oh, not one even gallon? that much. One-gallon tank. Yeah. So just put one cap in, one or two caps in, run that till it runs dry. Right when it's getting down to where it's starting to putter a little bit, you know, turn off the fuel uh, from the fuel tank if you can. Yep. Let it keep running dry till there's nothing else left in there. and, uh, and It'll then- actually shut off. And it'll, yeah, it'll turn off on its own. Yep. yep. Um, and then uh, one, should they lubricate anything? Oh, grease and lube everything grease before you put it away. Before you put it away. Yeah. Okay, so anywhere there's a grease cert. Yep. You want to grease. And then I actually use like a silicone spray Okay, um, for lubing the auger system and everything to shoot. Sure, where all the joints are where and all, the moving pieces. Yeah, and wherever you have a little rust spot maybe, yeah. just soak that down with some uh, silicone. Yep. Now, uh, sometimes people fog. Is fogging a thing? Yep. You can fog your, take your spark plug out and then fog the cylinder. And that's so. just a spray. That's just a spray, yeah. Yep. So your spark plug, you guys, you can take that out, spray a little uh, fogger in there. Seafoam, I think, makes us fogger, don't they? Yes, they do. Yeah, so you can get the seafoam fogger, just spray it right in there. Do you have to uh, run it at all then? or Just, just pull it over a couple times. Okay, so just pull the handle a couple times yep. to get a couple of rotations. And then the cylinder will go up and down a couple times. That'll lube everything inside the cylinder. Sure. So then there's even if there, even if some water or something like that does get in there, it's not going to start corroding. Anything. Correct. Okay, cool. Um, and then as far as storage, just put a sheet over it and call it a day. Yep. And Put it away in the shed. Put it away in, yeah. Wherever you store it. Um, I like to mention it, if you do have a storage shed that's actually outside, you might want to put a couple of dryer sheets or something on the tires and stuff just to keep the mice out. Oh, okay. Of sure. the cavity, that you know they'll crawl up inside the motor and stuff and uh, find a spot. Yeah, they'll yeah. build a nest in there, and we've run into that quite a bit where they sure. My mo- little, make their my, little home right in the. My mother in law, she used to have the mice get up underneath the car, and they'd they'd fill oh, it up because yeah. they'd go to Arizona and they'd come back and they're <laughs> mouse nests in the car yeah. in in the the muffler and all that kind of stuff, and the car wouldn't run right. What you know? they do is they they love the uh, like the spark plug wires. Mm-hmm. I think they're actually made out of a little peanut butter. Oh, and they. <laughs> Eat they sit up. and chew that up, oh, and yeah, then no. you got problems. That's in, like air, in con- fall. air conditioner wires and stuff. Too. Yep, yeah, yep. yeah. Um, and then uh, I guess so. That is uh, winterizing your snowblower. Uh, as far as uh, the difference between homeowner maintenance and professional maintenance, um, I mean, I guess if, if you know what you're doing, that there's not a whole lot of difference between me coming out. I. I I do go through uh, everything and and tighten bolts and stuff that you probably wouldn't Think uh, normally do. Might not even be able to access in those cases without taking it apart. Some of them, yeah. I mean, the belly pan on the bottom of the snowblower and stuff, we take that all off and lubricate everything inside there, the gearbox and yeah. the shafts and everything. So, sure. I mean, we do a thorough tune-up when we do come out. Yep. So, And how often should somebody be in their equipment tuned up? Um, it kind of depends on the individual and actually how much they use it. Okay. Um, usually a snowblower we can get away with every other year. Okay. Um, your lawnmowers, I would recommend that doing it every year. You do use those a lot more than the snowblowers and especially sharpening the blade is, is huge. I mean, you can actually kind of see it. It'll actually start to tear the grass Mm -hmm. instead of actually cut it. Yeah. It'll. Like yeah. split ends on your hair. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you can actually see it when the blade is getting dull. And that's not so. not good for your grass either. No. You know, so. No, it doesn't uh, help yeah. the grass grow or Get anything like that. all kinds like of, uh, you know, uh, diseases and things like that. Correct. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the one thing I was, like, there's got, I know you talked about the, the boat motors are difficult, but what, is there ever been any, like, horror stories? Like, you showed up and the thing was, like, melted or something like that or oh there's a few well <laughs> the mouse nests are probably the worst the worst ones yeah yeah you know we got to take the cowling off the top of the motor and you have a huge mouse nest there's some even still alive in there <laughs> Joe, snakes <really? laughs> oh yeah sure hello here we go <laughs> yeah tammy's like yeah. i'm not going to work with russ <laughs> yeah 
But uh, yeah, so and then uh, as far as um, contacting you for repairs, we're going to put your uh, the number up on the bottom of the screen here. You can also go to the com and you can get uh, their information to contact them via email or by phone. Um, uh, his wife is Janet. She's the uh, the wonderful, lovely voice on the other side of the phone and she'd be happy to help you out. Um, either the Russ will help you out or they'll refer you to one of their franchises depending on where you live and stuff. Um, again, if you're looking to get into a franchise and you'd like to do some mobile repair stuff, there's some cash to be made. Yes, there um, is. And it's uh, basically a recession-free um, oh, yeah. business. So yeah. there, there's never going to be a time where people stop cutting their grass or stop shoveling their driveway. Um, and uh, it's something that uh, you can definitely get into, make some cash doing it. And uh, it uh, uh, sounds like a fairly easy transition if you're mechanically inclined. Yes. You know? Yeah, if we you, can train you really easy. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you're not mechanically inclined, uh, 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 well, you know. We can teach you pretty much everything. Yeah. You can always give it a shot. Give it you know? a shot. Yeah, go right. And Russ, like I said, he, he did volunteer to, to have you guys go along for a ride along one day just to see what it's like, you know, yep. and, and to see if you'd be even interested. You know, uh, you don't have to make a full on commitment right away. You can check it out, see what it's like, talk to him more about it. He loves talking about it. This is what he does every day, <laughs> you guys. Okay. So he'd love to talk to you about it. Um, but if you're interested in that at all or you're looking for a job, uh, definitely hit him up. All right. Um, but those are the mobile repair guys, you guys. Remember, if you do need your equipment serviced or maintained, give them a call. They'll come right to you. You don't have to to take your snowblower anywhere you don't have to take your lawnmower anywhere to get it taken care of and make sure that it's going to work when you need it to all right when your equipment dies call the guys <laughs> i love a tagline tagline when your equipment dies call the guys tammy we need a tagline do i have a tag oh yeah i kind of do have a tagline the better you take care of your home the better it takes you okay I got i'm with you we're with you all right now we do have our giveaway question of the week um and russ is going to participate in this one so the giveaway question of the week uh, we do have a $25 Buffalo Wild Wings gift card going out here to the first person that can answer this question correctly. As always, remember, if you've won a prize in the last month, you cannot win again uh, this month, or not cannot win this time, but you can win after it's outside of a month. Um, but we do have a $25 Buffalo Wild Wings gift card on the line for answering this question. And if you can't answer it right now, if you're not in the comments below or something like that, you can always watch the replay and put it in the comments there. First person to put it in the comments will win the gift card. Um, the question is, what is the most common small engine repair according to the mobile repair guys? Oh, you got this. It's mentioned a couple times today. So oh, yeah. if you've been paying attention at all, <laughs> you should be able to get the answer um, and uh, pretty easily uh, put that in there for you, either in the comments or in the uh, comments on the uh, replay video. Um, but Russ will provide us the answer. Russ gave us the answer. So we have that. And uh, um, it is according to Russ. So it's not something you can Google. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, if you want to call Russ up and ask him, um, I guess maybe, but I don't know. Janet know. would know it too. Would so, Janet know it too? Oh yes. Janet would know it For too. Sure. All right, there you go. Um, <laughs> and then uh, the the next thing we got um, is the five top five enemies of your small engine equipment. Top five enemies. Now I put I put five down here. They're up there right uh, under where it says segment six. There. Um, any of those you disagree with? Uh, water is pretty big. Yeah. Um, water basically leading to corrosion. Right. Yeah. And, stuff. and there, there again, it's actually could get into your uh, fuel tank too. Mm -hmm. So it caused rusting because a lot of the older fuel tank, well, even all the newer ones are a lot of plastic, right? But, yeah. But your water is actually heavier than fuel. Okay. So that will actually drain down to your carburetor. Oh, and get in there and mess things up. Too. Well, not only that, but your initial suction is going to be water instead of fuel Yeah. when you first try to start your mower or lawnmower yep. or snowblower. Yeah. So you're actually sucking water into your, by your spark plug and it, <laughs> it won't good. fire. It won't fire. Yeah. F water, not flammable. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> water, not flammable. Uh, we also had uh, poor lubrication. Yep. That's Pretty a huge common. one. Yeah. Right. So grease and lube, po folks, it's not that hard. Uh, a grease no. gun is maybe what? 15 bucks at Harbor Freight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, very not cheap, not very expensive. Easy to use. Easy to use. Yep. The oil, I uh, use lubricated. Yeah. Whatever kind of oil you want to lubricate uh, joints, like in the snowblower, all that, where all the auger and all that kind of, there's a lot of little parts that move around in there. If you can keep a little oil on them, not only is it going to stop water from getting in there and causing corrosion and stuff, but it's going to help those parts flow smoother, yeah. not get jammed stuck and not get built up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fill up are the, friendly. Yeah, yep. yeah, very much, very friendly. And then when you're filling up with grease, a lot of times people don't know how to use it. They're like, and <laughs> how many pumps do I give it? You give it enough pumps until you see a little bit of grease squirting out where it's supposed to. Just a tiny bit yep. coming out your on the ends of whatever you're Greasing. filling. Yeah, yep. 
Yeah, so. whether it's an axle or a shaft or yep. whatever. Yeah, correct. Um, but uh, yeah, f- uh, find those greasers. They look like little uh, uh, little nipples. Just okay. a button, a little, yeah, little, little, little hole, little hole. Tammy will put a picture of a grease cert on the screen for you in the replay here. Um, but yeah, you just stick the the uh, grease gun on there. Make sure you seat it nice and tight, and then you give it a couple of pumps. And yep. uh, usually, a couple of pumps is all you should need. If you need more than a couple of pumps, you've been neglecting. Really dry. Yeah, yeah, then it's really dry. You want to uh, give it a couple of pumps. You should see a little bit of grease squirt out. The not a lot, not a big glump, but just like a little bit should come out. Um, they do sell electric grease, grease guns, and unless you grease a lot, I wouldn't get an electric grease. Gun. Those can be overused. They, you just hold right. that trigger down, and you're going nuts. I have a tractor up north, so I use. I use. I mean, there's a lot of grease shirts on a John Deere tractor, obviously. So I have an electric one, just out of that, convenience. Yeah. Plus, some of them are in weird spots, you know. And yeah, get your rubber hose one. Yeah, it's flexible. A, it's hose a little one. longer. Mine's like the one. The yep. electric ones. I got like a five foot hose on it, or whatever, you know. So I can just set it on the ground and get into places and stuff. Yeah. And then I put a, one of those uh, auto locking uh, tips oh, on it. So tips you, on it. Yeah. So I don't it have to worry pop about off it. it. Won't pop you're... off when I'm pressurizing it, you know, and yep. stuff. Um, neglected maintenance. Is that a big Huge, one? Huge, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> your air filter on your lawnmowers. You can actually take that out once in a in a while, you know, during the season. Yeah. Just blow it out. Just blow it out. Yeah. Okay. It's, I've heard of guys wash them out with gas. Like they put a little gas in a bowl and you can. Um, it. but uh, air is plenty actually. Yeah. There's a pre filter on the outside of your regular air filter on some of them. Okay. You know, taking that one, you could probably soak in gas. You know. Yeah. But there again, sometimes that'll expand and then. It just kind of ruins it. Sure, sure. So air is probably your best bet. Yeah. Just blowing those out. And, and the air filter very easy to access, right? It's just oh, a little yeah. plastic housing on the outside of the motor. And yep. usually just got to take off. Sometimes even just a little nuts. Butter, butterfly nut sometimes you take it off. And, usually and it's, it's just a butterfly nut. Yeah, right there. And it's easy to take off. Um, it's uh, not something to, if you're taking that, if you you're, your machine's not running and you take that off and you take the, the, the filter off and it now starts running, something's wrong with your mower or your <laughs> engine. It's not, that's how you're supposed to operate it. So yeah. that, that, at that point, call Russ. <laughs> All right. Um, and then uh, fuel issues. Uh, that's my biggest thing with the snowblower, you know, because it just sits in that ethanol. It just. Yeah. Storage is kind of your biggest thing with that. Again, you know, storing it the right way for the summer. Yeah. we Since the last time you guys came, I switched over to the can fuel yep. and the seafoam and I haven't had an issue. Yeah, and so that's been really good. Very and good. Um, yeah, but uh, you know, having some regular maintenance done, getting a tune-up done once in a while, just to make sure things are staying tight. Because like Russ said, they go and they tighten everything up and make sure that things are going to stay together for you. Yeah. The last thing you want to do is when that uh, you know 18-inch snowfall comes and your snowblower conks on you. Guess who's busy? And guess yeah. who's booked out of ways and not going to be able to get to you right away? Uh, let's see. Most common gasoline carburetors. Kelsey Martin won the gasoline carburetors. Um, nice. She wins the twenty-five dollar gift card. Congratulations, congratulations, Kelsey. Way to go! Yeah, carburetors by far the most common issue. Yes. You know, yes, um, yeah. by far, and primarily related to ethanol fuel. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, the next thing Im- uh, that I had improper operation. No, oh, like somebody usually not too you know? much. I mean, there's like a user error. <laughs> no. Well, I'm sure there's some, but so what would you say? Should be number five. I would actually st- go back to the stressing that maintenance, that neglect. Yep, yeah, neglect of just general maintenance yeah. on it. Yeah, uh, yeah. you know, if engines, uh, uh, whether they're uh, fuel or, um, you know, electric, all that equipment requires maintenance. You yes. know, even if you just are operating off a battery, you still have to maintain that equipment. It's still got spinning blades and other parts that move around and stuff that need to be. The old saying is pay me now or pay me later. Yeah, yeah, you exactly. Know, and sometimes pay me later costs a lot more than right. pay me well, now. You're probably buying a new unit by then. Yeah. So yeah. Could it be if, improper storage? Because if you don't prep it and store it then it won't work the following season that that's part of it with the the snow blowers especially you know your lawnmowers and stuff they're usually can, a bigger engine yeah so yeah they can handle but your more. push mowers and stuff there again your storage for the winter yeah. um is kind of the same process as you would for your snow blower mm-hmm. you know run it dry on fuel add your stabilizer right at the end Yep. Um, run it a little bit and then pour a couple capfuls in at the end and yep. lubricate that. You could fog your cylinder 
Yeah. You know, yeah, that, that general too. maintenance. Yeah. And really not that expensive to do those things. No, not but, at all. But man, does it save you the bills later on, you know? Tons of money later if, on. If you don't take care of that equipment and you put it away and there's moisture in the fuel or whatever, you know, you're causing in problems inside your engine that are in some cases unrepairable. One thing I'll suggest, I mean, as far as your lawnmower goes, is um, the deck itself. If you can get underneath there and scrape that dead grass off, old grass, you yeah. know, if you cut when it's a little damp outside, um, your blades are going to be spinning a lot easier if you get some of that grass and stuff off the bottom of the deck. Yeah. Take your push mower and always tip it to the oil fuel, uh, oil side, drain tube side. Okay. You can tip that up and then scrape Which the bottom of the deck is off. It's usually the non-shoot side, right? Yeah, that changes depends on which depends unit on you brand. have okay. yep. yeah yeah but um, always the oil filler tube side or the oil drain side yeah you want to tip that towards the ground and then you because if you tip it the other way then the oil is actually going to run into the filter box oh okay you don't want so that you don't want that yeah so um yeah just a couple of great tips you guys to help you maintain and take care of your small engine equipment um russ benzer from the uh, mobile repair guys would love to help you guys out if you do need some maintenance and stuff um now the next thing we have is our tip of the week tip of the week do 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 um yeah call me <laughs> some of the most smart asses out there um but uh the tip of the week today um is going to be clean or replace your air conditioner drain pan um hose so lots of times i go into homes and i find uh, uh furnaces that have uh all kinds of rusting and water damage and stuff because the um drain pan underneath your air conditioner in your basement gets clogged up and it overflows and causes all kinds of damage to your furnace and yeah. it, i mean a furnace you guys is not meant to be submerged or have water on it so if you're running water down the side of it because this pan is overflowing you're going to cause damage to your furnace pretty quickly and a replacement furnace Eight thousand, six to eight thousand bucks these days. You know, it's expensive, um, and uh, it can be very preventable. So, coming out of your furnace, there's going to be a, a hose or a tube. So most of the time, it's going to be a clear hose of some kind going down and going leading to the floor drain. This is where the uh, drain from uh, the drainage from the condensation in your air conditioner or from your high efficiency furnace is going to drain down through that tube, go into the floor drain, and drain away. All right, if that tube is blocked at all, okay, or kinked or pinched or has something set on it, the water's going to back up into that pan and flow over and go onto your furnace causing electrical problems causing rusting on the inside causing rust in your heat exchanger all kinds of issues um, but to replace that hose is not very expensive. You can go to your local Ace Hardware. You can go to your local True Value. Um, I don't know that they would sell that stuff at Home Depot like clear tubing and stuff. Probably not. Not They Home might Depot. have it in the plumbing section. Maybe. I don't know for sure. Yeah. You might have to buy those. Might not have the right size though. <laughs> yeah. And that'd be the other issue. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, replacing that tube is probably the best way to go. The condensate constantly running through there will leave this boogery layer in there that will eventually build up and block that hose. And it's just a neglect thing. Um, if you don't want to buy a new hose and you're a cheapskate, um, then you can take that hose out and put run hot water through it for a long time, and it'll eventually clean all the boogers and everything out of there. Um, but when you do that, you also have to clean the nozzle or the tip that's coming out of the drain pan. Um, otherwise, that can get build up as well. Um, some of them do have CPVC or PVC as their drain tubes. Those, again, you can clean with hot water. Okay, you just got to run a bunch of hot water through there. Otherwise, they do make, uh, just like cleaning a gun, they can get those uh, little brushes that you stick through there and just pull that thing right through there, and that'll clean the whole inside of that pipe. Um, that would be an option as well. But either way, you got to get it clean. If you don't get it clean, it's going to cause a backup and cause damage to your furnace and premature failure. And, you know, that's never a good thing, especially here in Wisconsin where we could have polar vortex tomorrow. I mean, mm -hmm. you never know, you know, <laughs> so who knows? Um, but that is your tip of the week, folks. Now, next week, um, we have uh, Team Smith coming in. Uh, Mark is going to come in here. We're going to talk about the home selling listing process, um, what you have to go through to list or sell your home. By the way, a great time to list your home. Um, I don't know how long the market's going to hold out for at these high uh, prices and stuff, um, but it is hot right now. People cannot keep uh, a house on the market for very long. Yeah. How long have you been in your place? Oh, um, going on 11 years. 11 years, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, the part of the thing with uh, listing these days, you guys are going to get more for that house than you probably ever will um, in, in the probably the next five to 10 years at this time. Um, things are going to adjust, and it's just a matter of time. But uh, Mark Smith and from the Smith team are going to come in here. They're going to talk about the home selling listing process with us. They're going to give us a brief market update. So where's the, the housing market at right now as we see it today? Um, we're also going to talk about the top three defects that destroy home sales. So what, what, what can be found 
in your home that's going to blow up your home sale. We're going to give you the top three, all right? Um, and we're also going to give you some good reasons to declutter your home, not just for your listing, but also just for living life, people, just for living life, all right? Thanks again to Russ Benzer for coming in and hanging Thank out you with very us much. today. I appreciate it. Um, yes. The mobile repair guys, folks, if you're looking for a job, look them up. They love to help you out. Uh, they have uh, great franchise opportunities there or employment opportunities, but they also would love to come out and help maintain and take care of your small engine equipment at your home, all right? Give them a call. Their website um, and uh, telephone information is all going to be up on our website. Otherwise, Tammy, you can pop it on the screen for us here. Uh, but thanks again for tuning in, you guys. Appreciate you. Hopefully, we'll see you next week. Um, remember, the better you take care of your house, you guys, the better it's going to take care of you. Have a good one. Thank you.